to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from one of our special guests. Some of you are wondering who I am. Let me tell you who I am. Whenever your computer goes down, (laughs) and you call for tech support, I'm here. I'm here in person. Uh, You know, all the jobs are being outsourced to India, and this morning's preaching has been outsourced as well. So so it's just a... uh, Rock is a great church. What a wonderful, wonderful church, the Rock Church. Thank God. Thank God for what he's doing here. And Pastor Jim and Pastor Deborah Cobray, amazing people. That's totally amazing. And how blessed we are to have them. And, And then Pastor Dan, Pastor Luke, and the entire crew here, they do a phenomenal job. Let's thank God for, for each, each and every, every one of them. I asked Pastor how long I had to preach, and he said, you can preach as long as you want to, but we will leave at 11.15. <laughs> so with that in mind, let's go to work. Let's go to work. Go to your Bibles, your New Testament to Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16, and uh, then go to your left, put a marker of some nature there, and go to your left to Luke chapter 15. Uh, Sorry, Mark chapter 15, Mark chapter 15. Romans chapter 16 and Mark chapter 15. And we'll get to that in, in just a moment, just a moment. How many of you have ever been a place in your life when you felt totally helpless. Just totally helpless. You couldn't do anything about it. Uh, In the New Testament, there are stories about people who were totally helpless. For example, there was this man who was paralyzed for 38 years, and he would go and sit outside this pool called Bethesda, and the angel of the Lord would come shake the water. Whoever jumped in first got healed. For 38 years, other people came, jumped, got healed, left. Came, jumped, got healed, left. For 38 years... He was paralyzed and nobody could help him till Jesus showed up and hey, but he was a helpless man. Uh, how about the man who uh, was going from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves and, and they robbed him and beat him up and left him for dead in the ditch till the good Samaritan came by and picked him up and bandaged his wounds and got, got him to, to an inn. But he was helpless till the good Samaritan showed up. Uh, how about the man who was paralyzed And he heard Jesus was in town, but he couldn't get there because there were so many people in that house. So his friends came and they carried him to the top of the roof and they opened the shingles and they lowered him in the presence of the Lord. He was helpless as well. Okay, yeah, let me give you another example. How about Lazarus? Lazarus was totally what? Dead. Dead. What do dead people do? Hopefully nothing. I mean, imagine I'm laying here, you know, room temperature. First of all, I've already told my wife, don't lay me like this. Put my hands behind my back. (laughs) Absolutely. And I don't want any church music. I want some sweet jazz. And I don't want no celebration service. I want people to cry. (laughs) Pass out teardrops as people are coming in. Yeah, you know... uh, (laughs) This is an expensive party, and I'm not even there. Because <laughs> after that, you're looking for some chicken and some beans and some potato salad. So, you know, uh, so I, I've got plans, but dead people don't do anything. And Lazarus was totally helpless till Jesus came by. However, in the Gospels, we have only one occasion in which Jesus is totally helpless. And nobody could help him. Heaven couldn't help him. And there was nobody on this planet, on earth, that was there available to help him. Let's read that story in Mark chapter 15, beginning verse 16. And the soldiers led him away into the hall called Praetorium. I'm in verse 16. And they called together the whole band. And they clothed him with purple and plaited a crown of horns and put it upon his head and began to salute him. Hail! king of the Jews, and they smote him on the head with a reed, and did spit upon him, and bowing their knees, worshipped him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple, 
from him and took his own clothes, put his own clothes on him and led him out to crucify him. Verse 21. And they compelled one Simon, a Cyrenian, who passed by coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Circle the word Rufus. We're going to come back to that. To bear his cross. Here's the story. Jesus just spent a night of agony in the Garden of Gethsemane. He has prayed with such fervency that his sweat is like drops of blood. In the middle of the night, there's a group of people, Jewish and Romans, who come to arrest Jesus. He's betrayed by one of his own, Judas Iscariot, who plants a kiss on him to identify who he was. And he sells him to the Jewish community for 30 pieces of silver. They arrest Jesus. They take him all night long. They take him to Pilate's court, to Caesar's palace. Pilate's court, Caesar's palace. They shunt him back and forth, trying to convict him. They beat him up. His face is swollen. His, his eyes are swollen shut. There's blood everywhere. They have plucked his beard. They have lacerated his back with whips. There is blood every, and they have mocked him. And they have beat him up. And now it is toward the morning. And the Bible tells us in our reading that they get him into the praetorium. The praetorium is the outer court. And it says to us in verse 16 that they call the entire band. So now it's not like 10, 15, 20 soldiers. All of them are there. And then they take a crown of thorns. And they plant it on his head. And then the Bible tells us they take sticks. Read the King James Word says, take sticks and start beating the crown into his head. His eyes are swollen shut. He's black, blue, and purple. Beard has been plucked. They spit upon him. He hasn't had anything to eat or drink all night. And now the thorns are, are biting into his forehead, are biting all around him, and there's blood coming down. And then they put on his clothes on him, a white robe that very quickly starts soaking up the blood, and it is crimson red. And then they put a cross on his back and say, carry this cross down Calvary's way to a hill called Golgotha. So he's carrying the cross. As he's carrying the cross, he's surrounded by Roman soldiers. He's surrounded by the Jewish community saying, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And as he's carrying the cross on the outskirts of Jerusalem, on the way to Golgotha, he falls. He has no physical strength. Nobody's there to help him. There are no disciples, no family, no friends. They've all left him, they've all fled. There's nobody there to help him. He falls. The cross falls on him, soaking in blood. And there he is, the son of man and the son of God, at the same time, with no help for him, in a totally helpless position. Hold that picture in your mind. Verse 21 introduces us to a man by the name of Simon. He says, Simon the Cyrenian, so he was from the city of Cyrene. So where is Cyrene? If you can picture in mind the Mediterranean Ocean in the Middle East. And the south end of the Mediterranean Ocean is the north end of the continent of Africa. About 12 to 18 miles south of the beach, south of the ocean, is a city called Cyrene. It is now found in our modern day Libya. Many of us have heard about Libya over the last few years. I'm not giving you any new revelation. All this is in your Bible. Mm, it's the par part that you've never been to. It's in the back, the only part of your Bible in color. <laughs> and pictures called maps. Mm -hmm. So this is not revelation knowledge. It's all right there. Mm -hmm. Some of you are saying, we got maps? Yes. <laughs> pictures, color pictures. Mm-hmm. So he's from Libya, and he gets his two boys, Alexander and Rufus, and they decide to go to Jerusalem for the Passover. Now, there's Libya to get to Jerusalem. They'd have to travel over Libya, travel over Egypt, enter the Palestinian peninsula, and then get to Jerusalem. How many of you know that in those days, they didn't have trains, planes, and automobiles? So it was on foot. How many of you have ever taken a road trip with your kids? So you haven't even barely backed out of your driveway. And they want to know what? 
Don't you feel like killing them? <laughs> Listen, if you have never felt like killing your child, you just don't have any children. <laughs> um, children can bring out homicidal tendencies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's amazing all any of us are still alive because our parents felt the same way about us. <laughs> Mine tried to kill me, but I got away. <laughs> so he gets his two boys, Alexander and Rufus, and they're about to take a three-month journey. A three-month journey because they've got to go over Libya, they've got to go over Egypt, then they're going to go into Palestine, into Jerusalem. So, Daddy, are we there yet? No, three more months to go. <laughs> a month into it, are we there yet? No, two more months to go. Another two months, are we there yet? No, one more month to go. And then there comes that morning in which Simon can see Jerusalem in the far distance and they know by nightfall they ought to be entering Jerusalem. He wakes up his boys, Rufus and Alexander. and says, boys, today is it. We've been traveling for three months today. So they are all excited. The whole entourage is excited. And they are going into Jerusalem. They're excited. They're, there's a lilt in their step. They're moving a little faster. And they are all talking, excited about, today we will be there. But as they get close to Jerusalem, they notice there's a crowd coming out of Jerusalem. At the front of the crowd are Roman soldiers with spears and daggers and, and swords and, and shields. And, and they're surrounded by the Jewish community saying, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And in the middle of it all is a man and he's carrying a cross. There's his, his bow totally disfigured. There's blood coming everywhere. His cross is dripping with blood. His clothes are dripping with blood. And he can barely carry the cross. Obviously a convict, obviously somebody who's done some heinous crime, obviously somebody who needs to be punished. And so they stand there to wait for the crowd to pass by. Right where Simon was standing, Jesus fell. His cross fell. And now, the Roman soldier asked Simon to carry the cross for Jesus. Something happened in that moment that teaches us three lessons from this wonderful story. I want to give you three lessons very quickly. Not lesson number one, Simon was there. Simon was there. Simon was where? There. Simon was there. Now, how many of you know that nothing in the life of Jesus happened by accident? His birth was prophesied. Where he was going to be born was prophesied. What town he was going to be born was born prophesied. How children in Bethlehem were going to die for him was prophesied. How he was going to be uh, crucified was prophesied. It's prophesied that his face was marred beyond recognition. Uh, his, his resurrection prophesied. Everything about the life of Jesus was prophesied. So everything in the life of Jesus was planned. Even uh, Paul tells us in the fullness of Time. So, so everything, remember John the Baptist, his cousin, one day pointed at Jesus and said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. He said, He is Lamb that was slain from the very foundations of the world. So everything is planned. And I'm here to tell you that the meeting of Jesus and Simon was no accident either. Their meeting was planned. There was a plan for Simon's life and he did not even know it. I come back to announce to somebody today, God's got a plan for your life. God's got a purpose for your life. God's got a destiny for your life. And he's moving you toward your destiny. You don't even know it. Because see, here's, the, here, here's what you got to get. Three months ago, three months ago, Simon... His boys Alexander and Rufus start the journey towards Jerusalem. A night ago, Jesus has been betrayed and now he's coming out of Jerusalem. A three month journey, a day and a half journey and God was bringing their destinies together all the way from Libya and I, oh yes, you gotta know that God is at work in your life. You don't see it, you don't smell it, you can't uh, understand it, but God is at work. Moving you toward your destiny. Something happened in my life this year that kind of blew my mind. Uh, happened in February, but I gotta tell the story before that. Last fall, I was in Orlando, Florida, speaking at a Christian business conference in a hotel, hundreds of people there. 
So they introduced me, and I got up here, and there's a second table. It was tables and chairs, you know, workshop kind of seminar type setting. And so there was a, the second table over here were acting weird, like they're pointing at me and laughing and talking to each other. But you know, church folk acting weird, nothing new there. <laughs> I mean, you know, they say in church, one out of three people is dysfunctional. <laughs> so look to your neighbor to your right <laughs> and the left. And if they seem to be okay, <laughs> might be you. <laughs> so they're acting weird, pointing at me, talking to each other. So after the session was over, I was at my book table uh, selling books and signing books. So line of people, I'm signing books at people coming up. The leader of the weirdos <laughs> and his wife buy my books and want me to sign the book. So, you know, they bought it. I'm signing it. No problem there. And then he says to me, I'm Pastor Brian Matthews. This is my wife, uh, Pastor Rhonda Matthews. And we have a church in Augusta, Georgia. And, and we would like for you to come and speak at our church. Mm, I said, mm -mm. I don't need to pray about this, you weirdos. <laughs> so I didn't want to say no. So I passed them off to my assistant who was standing uh, about 10, 12 feet away. I said, talk to her. She might be able to work it out. Well, I didn't get a chance to tell her, <laughs> you know, some kind of a language, you know, but I didn't have a chance to do that. So she booked them <laughs> for February of this year. So I was going to be there on Saturday uh, Sunday, and so they contacted and said, hey, listen, if you can come in early on Saturday, we would like to take you out for dinner. I said, that's cool. I mean, free food. <laughs> I'm all for that. So... Uh, so we, 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 uh, they pick us up at the hotel, and they took, uh, they took us to a beautiful restaurant, five-star restaurant. And in the back, there was this private dining room, a uh, beautiful area. And it was set up in a, in a square, and everyone's sitting on the outside. So me and my wife, they set us right in the middle. And they're all sitting there gawking at me, <laughs> like I'm the new panda bear in the zoo. So, so, so you know how your wives do, you know, she's got my hand and she is doing this to my hand. And that is secret code language, like, let's get out of here. So I am saying, but we have not ate yet. So you know, S-T-A-Y, stay. So you know, so we are going through all of this under the table and, uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, under the table. So. Uh, uh, so, 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 so the pastor's wife says to me, Dr. Chen, we have a story to tell you. I said, mm-hmm, story time. <laughs> she says this. She said, in 1986, God called us to start a church. And in that year, in 1986, God gave us a prophetic word. And the prophetic word was that there'll be a man from India. His name will be Sam. And when he comes to your church, your church will take a wonderfully new direction. We've been praying for this man called Sam from India since 1986. She says, most of these people around this table have been with us since 1986. Good church, about 3,000 people, something like that. Uh, we've been praying for this man from India, every, every week we have a prayer meeting and we say, Lord, where is this man from India whose name is Sam? And then they introduced you in Orlando, Florida. And as you got up there to talk, we all looked at each other and said, that's him. In 1986, I was pastoring a church in Michigan. I did not know them, did not know about Augusta, Georgia. So this is them. This is me. I'm living my life and they are praying. I'm just doing what God has asked me to do and they keep praying. I had no idea that God had a plan and a purpose for us to meet with one another. I'm here to tell you God is at work in your life. Everyone get your hands out like this. Get your fingers out like this. Don't have to shake it. I'm just nervous right now. <laughs> this is just nervous energy, you know? If Jim Cobra is watching me, I'm even more nervous. 
Mm -hmm. If the left hand is where you are in life today, where you in life today, and your right hand is your destiny, and as they come closer and closer and closer and closer and closer together, you can see your destiny, but the destiny can see you. You can see where you're going, but where you're going can see you. And there will be that moment when they come together. And when they come together, explosive things happen because you know you run into your destiny. Simon was there and you are here. The second lesson that I learned is that sometimes God will ask you to do things you don't want to do. Do I have a witness on that? Mm -hmm. Let's look at Mark chapter 15, verse 21. Verse 21. And they compel one Simon, a Cyrenian. Compel, compel, compel. How many of you know that compel is the opposite of volunteer? <laughs> okay, let's work with this word compel. How many of you got kids? When you ask them to go clean their room, they go and do it immediately. <laughs> do I have a liar in this room? <laughs> See, that is where we say, if you ever do that, you never, yeah, you, why do you have to take after your mama's side of the family? <laughs> you'll never come out of your room. If I have to get up from my chair, you'll be sorry. <laughs> Compel. So I want you to picture the scene here. Jesus has fallen. He's bruised and bloodied. You can't even see his eyes. He can't see out of his eyes. There's blood everywhere because of the crown of thorns. His clothes are soaked in blood. The cross is soaked in blood. And there he's fallen. He has no physical strength to carry his cross any further. There are the Roman soldiers. And there's Simon the Cyrenian. The Roman soldiers have three options. Option number one is to ask another Roman to carry the cross. But they were the conquerors, they were the occupiers, they were the ones in charge, so they were not going to do that. The number two option was to ask a Jewish person to carry the cross. But if a Jewish person carried the cross, they would be unholy, and the feast of the Passover was the day after tomorrow. So they couldn't do that. Option number three, they look up and say, ah, there's a foreigner. Because of the way he was wearing his clothes, they could tell by his attire that he was not from, those, from that neighborhood. And they compel him. Can you imagine Roman soldiers saying, hey, carry that cross. <laughs> Simon says, hey, man, I'm jet lagged. <laughs> you know, I've been traveling. Do, do you know where I'm coming from? I'm coming from Libya. I've been over Egypt. I mean, we've been on the road for three months. No, sir, find somebody else. Till he felt the poke of the Roman sword on his chest. And his no became a... Yes, sir. And he starts carrying the cross for Jesus. I want you to know, in the most helpless moment, God will ask you to do some stuff you do not want to do. Simon, where are you going? I'm going into Jerusalem. What are you going to do there? I'm going to go to the Passover. And then all of a sudden, your journey is intercepted. And instead of going into Jerusalem, now you're coming out of Jerusalem. And you're carrying a cross with blood all over you because the blood from the cross got on the back of Simon the Cyrenian. Isn't it wonderful to know that because before Jesus shed his blood on the cross of Calvary, Simon got the blood on his... Mm. Oh, you got to know that in the most difficult times, uh, God will ask you and compel you to do something, uh, but you, have, you cannot see where God is taking you because he is at work in your life. Uh, he's not going to wait for you to get it, understand it, agree with it. Uh, he's going to confront you uh, in that moment of your life when you're the most helpless and ask you to do stuff you never wanted to do. But God got a plan for your life. Uh, and you might as well say, yes, uh, don't wait for somebody to do something. Uh, feel the anointing of the Holy Spirit uh, and say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. But the third lesson that I learned is found in Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16. And the lesson there is that in the most helpless moment, your destiny is changing. Your destiny is changing in the most helpless moment. Romans chapter 16, verse 13. 
Romans chapter 16, verse 13. Romans chapter 16, verse 13 says this. Salute who? Rufus. Remember Rufus? Chosen in the Lord and his mother and mine. So let's do a little Bible study over here about the Gospels and the Epistles. The, the Gospel of Matthew is written to the Jewish community. The Gospel of Luke is written to the Greek community by Dr. Luke. The Gospel of John is written to the believers at large. But the Gospel of Mark is written to the believers who are in Rome, Italy, to be specific. They are in the city of Rome, and the gospel is being written to them. So when Mark is writing the gospel, and in there he mentions Simon the Cyrenian and his sons Alexander and Rufus, he assumes that everybody in the church knows who they are. So if I was to write a letter to Pastor Cobray, and it was read aloud over here, and that letter I said, and please give my regards to Pastor Dan and Pastor Luke. Other churches may not know, but you all would know who I'm talking about. So Mark assumes everybody knows. Fast forward to the Gospel of Romans, the Epistle of Romans. Uh, Epistle of Romans is being written by the Apostle Paul. Paul has not gone to Rome yet. He's about to go to Rome. He's never been to Rome. But he's going to go to Rome, Italy, Europe. And before he gets there, he's writing them a letter. In that letter, he's trying to explain to them, hey, listen, this is how I feel about things. This is how I feel about God's grace. That's what that epistle is about. In chapter 7, for example, he says, I want you to know the wrestling between the old man and the new man, the carnal man and the born again man. In chapter 8, he talks about the sovereignty of God. Romans 8, 28, for we know that all things work out together. So he's talking about all those things. And now he's ending the book in chapter 16, Romans chapter 16. And he's writing off saying, hey, listen, give my love to Uncle Joe and Aunt Sally. And in there he says... Salute Rufus, who's in Italy. But what blows my mind is the end of that same verse. Look with me on that. Romans 16, verse 13. Salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. His mother and mine. So Simon has sons Rufus and Alexander. Mrs. Simon is like a mother to Paul. So how did that happen? How did Mrs. Simon become like a mama to Apostle Paul? I don't know. You don't know. So let's make it up. <laughs> don't try this at home. We go to Bible calls to learn how to do this. The Rock Bible College specializes in that. <laughs> so work with me on this. They go to Jerusalem, Simon and his boys. After the Passover, they go back home to Libya. Mrs. Simon, Mama Simon, is waiting for them. She wants to know, so what happened? Tell me about it. So Alexander and Rufus, the boys, they step up and say, Mom, Mom, you will not believe this. Oh, we tra traveled for three months, and finally we're about to enter the city of Jerusalem. It was the day we could see the city. And as we were going into the city, we saw this whole crowd coming out of the city. There were Roman soldiers everywhere. They were yelling and shouting, crucify him, crucify him. And in the front, there was this man who was carrying a cross. There was blood everywhere. Mommy, his eyes were swollen shut. There was a crown of thorns. There was blood everywhere. His cross was just full of blood. And then he, right where we were standing, Mommy, he fell. And, and, and the cross fell. And they, they made Daddy carry his cross. We were so scared. We didn't know what was going to happen? They carried, daddy had to carry the cross all the way up to Golgotha. 
where they laid this man on this cross. They had big nails and spikes and they drove it into his hands and into his feet and, they, and, and then they dug a hole and, and then they lifted up the cross and the, the, dropped the cross in the hole and, and he lurched from the cross and then the Roman soldiers let us go and we were able to get back into Jerusalem in time for the Passover. You know, the Bible is so inspiring and so frustrating. I would love to know what happened between Jesus and Simon. Uh, when, when Simon picked up the cross of Jesus, what did Jesus say to him? Did Jesus say to him, thank you, man? <laughs> did Jesus say to him, sure, I'm glad you showed up? Did Jesus say anything to him? Because you see, there is Simon carrying that bloodied cross all the way to Golgotha. His boys, Alexander and Rufus, are trying to tag along with daddy. And on this side, there's Jesus, barely able to take one step in front of the other, can barely see out of his eyes because they're all swollen shut, because there's blood everywhere. What happened between the two of them? But I do know this much, as Alexander and Rufus are telling the story to mama, Simon steps up and says, babe, can I tell you something? I left home one way, but I'm coming back another way. Something happened on that road. I thought I was going there, but God had another plan for my life. So back to how did Paul end up calling Mrs. Simon his mama? Well, when they were in Libya, they packed up their stuff, got a U-Haul. Read your Bibles. <laughs> it says that in my Bible. God, you all. And moved from Libya to Jerusalem. When they had moved to Jerusalem, there was a young man known as Rabbi Saul who was a great man who had studied the feet of Gamaliel, the greatest teacher of that time. And he was out persecuting the church, imprisoning Christians, killing Christians, dividing families. But somewhere in Acts chapter 9, on the road to Damascus, as he's going out to persecute the church, he gets confronted by the Holy Spirit and he gets saved. And somehow through all of that, he ends up coming into the household of Simon, where there's Mrs. Simon. Mrs. Simon, mama, starts pouring into him starts mentoring him, starts coaching him, starts growing him in the Lord, starts nurturing him, starts giving him the word of the Lord. And it became such that there was such a bond between the two of them that he starts calling her what? Mom. Mom. And now she is in Rome. And he's writing this letter to her son and all the believers and saying, hey, Rufus, see you soon. But don't forget to give my love to my ma. Oh, you got to know that on this road over here, oh, you got to get this, on the road between Jesus and Simon, God had an intercontinental plan. He was going to move people from Africa, move them into Asia, and then move them into Europe and in, in Italy. So you ask Simon, 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 what are you doing right now? Right now, I'm just carrying a cross. Right now, my life is being disturbed. Right now, I'm feeling helpless. But Simon, if you could only see just a few years down the road, you and your family are leading a church in Rome, Italy. If you could only see the plan that God has in store for you. Because all we can see ourselves right now is carrying that bloodied cross. But if you and I could fast forward our life, and see it where God sees us. And God saw everything happening. I'm here to declare to you, doesn't matter what's going on in your life, God is at work in your life and He's bringing everything together for you. So Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, that you remind us. You remind us that you are at work. Even in the most helpless moments of our life, you will never leave us nor forsake us. In a moment, many, 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 many people will leave their seats and come to these altars saying, God, give me strength in my helpless moment.
And you're going to do what you've always done. Meet us at our point of need. In Jesus' name. Stand with me, please. Everyone standing. Everyone standing. All of this building. Everyone standing. Everyone standing. Everyone standing. You hear this morning. And say, I heard the word. But I'm going through a helpless place in my life. It could be in your physical body. Could be in your finances, your money. Could be in your job, your business. Could be in your family, your relationships, your marriage. Could be a personal issue going on with you. Maybe you walk with the Lord, but you're feeling that helplessness in your life. And you want God to strengthen you today. In a moment, I'm going to invite you to the front so I can pray with you. Because you see, (laughs) our story invites us to understand that in the most helpless moment, God is rearranging your destiny. If you had asked Simon what was going on right then, all he could see was what was going on. If you asked Rufus what happened, oh, daddy had to carry a cross. But if you could fast forward and, and interview Rufus in Rome, he would say, oh, man, <laughs> we thought it was over for us. But God had a plan for our life in the most helpless moment. God made himself real. So if you hear this morning, And you're going through a challenging time in your life and you're feeling that helpless feeling. I'm here to tell you that God got a plan for your life and he wants to touch your life and you can leave here totally changed and transformed. So if you're going through a time in your life, I just want you to do something special for yourself. I want you to leave your seat and meet me right here. I want to pray with you. Just come on down real quickly. You know who you are. Don't wait on anybody else. Just come real quickly. Move real quickly. Move as close as you can. There'll be many, many, many people coming behind you. There'll be hundreds of people coming behind you. So just move on up as close as you can so we can make room for, for everybody. Keep coming. Keep coming, keep coming. I see you coming. I see you coming. Keep coming, keep coming. Come on, come on, come. Come real quickly. Come on, come on. I see you coming. I see you coming from the upper level. Keep coming. I see you coming. Just move on up, move on up, move on up, move on up, move on up. Make room for people come behind you. Yes, come on, come on, come on. I see you coming. I see you coming. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Keep coming, keep coming, keep coming, keep coming, keep coming. Look at me just for a moment. Let me talk to you. Let me talk to you. Let me talk to you. How many of you are glad? that heaven did not rescue Jesus that day. Because if heaven had rescued Jesus, we wouldn't be here. The entire plan of salvation would have been aborted. And what we want to do is for heaven to come and snatch us out of the mess that we are in. And what he's saying to us is, if you can stay faithful in the middle of your mess, I got plans for you. You're going to be relocating from Libya. And you're going to be relocating in Jerusalem. And I'm going to bring a man called Saul whose name is Paul. And you're going to mentor him. And then you're going to get up into Europe. I got some plans for your life. But if you want me to rescue you right now, that will never happen. If God could just take our lives, not rewind, but fast forward our lives. If God could just take us to where... He sees us. (laughs) We'll be able to look back on this and say, oh, happy day. Oh, happy day. Because right now, it is oh, sad day. Oh, terrible day. Oh, dismal day. Oh, disappointing day. Oh, depressing day. Because that's our song. But if you could just come over here and look back on your life, you got to say, oh, happy day. Oh, happy day. Oh, happy day. Oh, happy day. So as Jesus, as Jesus has fallen, as Jesus has fallen down, he doesn't have strength to carry his cross. (laughs) What is heaven saying to him? I believe heaven said to him, stay faithful. Because see, the night before that, he's in the Garden of Gethsemane. And you remember his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane? Lord, if there's any way possible, I know I came to die, but if there's any way possible, I, you know, kind of sort of, sort of, okay, can we work this out? Uh, can you, if this cup can pass away from me, Lord, is there a plan B? And I hear heaven say to him, stay faithful, stay faithful, stay faithful, stay faithful, stay faithful. Can I remind you, when you have money, stay faithful. When you're broke, stay faithful. When you're feeling good, stay faithful. When you're feeling bad, stay faithful. When you got a job, stay faithful. When you're unemployed, stay faithful. When all is well, stay faithful. When nothing is working out, I will stay, 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 stay. I will stay faithful. 
Lift your hands to the Lord all over this building, all over this building. Father, my hand is lifted, my brothers and sisters. We find ourselves in that place in our life. We find ourselves in that place in our life in which we say, Lord, rescue me. And you're saying to us, if I rescued you right now, you will never walk into your destiny. But if you'll stay faithful, I have an intercontinental plan for your life. So Lord, right now with our hands lifted up, we want to declare to you that I will stay faithful. I will stay I will stay You can count on me for I will stay When I have it going on I will stay When all hell is breaking loose I will stay When I'm feeling good I will stay When I'm not feeling well I will stay When I have money I will stay When I'm broke I will stay In all my life I will stay and because you're a prayer answering God, because you have never let us down, because your history is impeccable with us, we put our hands together and give you praise in this place. We give you glory in this place. We give you honor in this place. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on. I will stay right where you're at. Nobody leaving. Stay right where you're at. Right where you're at. Right where you're at. The most helpless position a human being can ever find themselves in is when you do not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I'm here to tell you, you can try anything in your life. It's not going to work <laughs> till you make Him your Lord and Savior. In a moment, I'm going to count to three. On the count of three, if you do not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you want to give your life to Him, I want you to lift your hand up. Keep it up there. I'm going to pray with you. That's what I want to do. I want to pray with you. Maybe you hear this morning and at one time, you knew the peace of the Lord. You knew the joy of the Lord. You were walking with the Lord, but then life happened, situations happened, and circumstances of life have taken you on a detour. You took the wrong exit, and you're not serving Him anymore. And you just want to rededicate your life in a count of three. I want to lift your hand as well. And I want to be the first one to welcome you home. In which you say, Lord, I want to rededicate my life. I just want to come back home. I want to make him a king all over again. So in a count of three, if you want to make Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life, lift your hand. And if, I, if you want to rededicate your life to the Lord, I want to lift your hand up as well. One, two, three. Can I see your hands? All over this building. All over this building. All over this building. Lift your hand. Keep, keep them hand. Keep them lifted up. Keep them lifted up. Come on, come on, come on. Let me, let me work the front Now I'm going to come to the back. So don't put your hand down there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 33, I'm coming into the, into the main area now, 33, 33, if I can't see you, wave at me, wave at me, if I can't see your hand, 33, I see you there, 34, 34, 34, anybody in this side, 34, I see you, wave at me, yeah, there you go, 35, I see you, sir. 36 in the blue shirt, 36, 36, 36, 36, 36. In the back, very, very, very back. Wave at me, there's a, yeah, 36, 37, 38, 38, 39, 39 on this side, 39. Wave at me, uh, I see you waving. 40, 41, I got you already. 41, I saw a hand here earlier. Can you wave back at me? Yes, there you go. 42, you got tired of keeping your hand up, I know. 42, 42, 42, 42, 42. This is what I want you to do. I want you to look in the rear view and take a step back. Will you do that? All of you, in the, don't go anywhere. Just stay right there. But step back, just step back, just step back, step back, step back. There you go. And those of you who lifted your hands, come on down. I want to pray with you. Those who lifted your hands, come on down. Come, come, come. Come on, step on up, step on up. Yeah, just stand right here, just stand right here, just stand right here. Come on, come on, come on. Come on. Yeah, just come this way, just come this way. There you go. Come on, come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Come, 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 come. 
Come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on, come on. Keep coming, keep coming. Come this way, come this way. Come to the front, come to the front. Yeah, come on up, come on up, come on up. Come on up, come on up, come on, come on. I see, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Come on, make room, they're coming behind you. Make room, make room, make room. Let them come, let them come, let them come, let them come. Come on, come on. Come, come, come. Come on up, come on up this way. Come on up this way, there's room for you. Come on. There you go. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Come on, come on, come on, keep coming, keep coming, keep coming, keep coming, come on, come on, come on, come on. I have Yes, 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 yes. This is the best decision you've ever made. See, you didn't come here by accident. Guess what God was doing? In the first service, I had at least three people come to me and say, Two of them said, this is my, not my church, but I don't know how I got here. <laughs> really? <laughs> and the third one says, his, actually her mother said, she never gets up in time for church. But this morning, somehow she got up. I'm here to tell you, they thought they came to church. God, God, God is bringing it all together. I want everyone in this room to repeat this prayer after me. Dear Jesus, thank you for coming this world, dying for me so I can live. I give you my life. Wash me of my sins. I repent of my sins. Forgive me of my sins. From this day forward, I will live for you. You're my king. You're my Lord. You're my Savior. I promise to you that I will stay faithful. 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 Come on. I will stay faithful. Stay faithful. The Bible tells us, the Bible tells us, the Bible tells us that when one person comes to the Lord, there's a party in heaven. There are 42 parties going on all over God's heaven. Come on! This good-looking young man with a wonderful hairdo. <laughs> Pastor Dave, he just wants to talk to you for three to four minutes, give you some information, bless you, pray with you and then you'll be released to go back home if you came with, with these people don't go nowhere they'll be out with you even before you get out so if you will just follow pastor dave this way just follow pastor dave all of you follow pastor dave the fall god bless you god bless you just follow pastor dave just follow pastor dave just follow past this way this way this way this way just follow pastor dave yes let go with pastor dave you all can go back to your seats and be seated. Follow after Pastor Dave. We got some young people. All right. Beautiful. Beautiful. Come on. Come on. Come on. You may be seated. You may be seated. You may be seated. You know, this is what it's all about, is it not? It's all about making hell empty and heaven full. It's all about making sure that people come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. You may be seated. You may be seated. I have brought some uh, books uh, at the, there's a book table there that I want to tell you about. This won't take but uh, a few seconds. Thank you so much for picking up your purse because you never know who's standing behind you. <laughs> yep, I've been in church all my life. You know, people come and sell you their books and they tell you it'll be a real blessing to you. I don't know about all that. I do know this, that if you buy my books, it'll be a real blessing to me. <laughs> so let's keep it real simple. Just, just, you know, there's nothing complicated about this. You buy, I get the blessing. If you read it, it might help you. If you don't read it, they're still pretty books. Keep them on your shelf. There's 30 seconds on each one of them. Ladder focus. All of my books for, uh, are, by the way, they're Christian books, but they're not written as a preachy book. So people buy these and give them to their co-workers, their supervisors, their bosses. They keep it for themselves. These are used in uh, all kinds of different settings. So 
uh, there's a, what I call crossover books, a way, a way to carry the message of the Lord. So ladder focus is about issues in your life that you need some ways to handle as to how to deal with conflict, how to deal with your vision, how to stay focused, how to make sure that when things are not going well, you can re-energize yourself. So ladder focus is when stuff takes your eyes off your focus, how to get back in focus. What's shaking your ladder is about 15 things that all of us are going to face. So there's a chapter on each one of them. For example, how to deal with difficult people, how to have a plan for your life, how to leave a legacy, how to make sure that uh, you are making the right decision. There's a whole chapter in here on making decisions. You know, because I went through college, graduate school, I never had a single course or workshop in how to make good decisions. I just make decisions, hope they turn out good. So, the, so this is a very practical how to, how to book. Planning your succession is for everybody who knows that they will die. Maybe you know something I don't know. But how many of you know 100 years from now, if the Lord does not come back, guess what's going to be happening in this room? There will be totally new people sitting here in your seat. Can you believe that? Uh-huh. So you're going to exit this world either by design or by default. Either you're going to exit knowing all is well after you're gone or you're going to leave a mess behind. Planning your succession is for people who want to die on design, who want to make sure that you do not leave a mess behind you. Leading in uncertain times. Leading in uncertain times reminds us that, that while the times are uncertain, we have a certain God. While we may not know about tomorrow, we know who holds tomorrow. And uncertain times are the time in which believers of all the people ought to live their life knowing that God's got it all. He's got it all. He's got it all. I don't have to worry about it. There's always going to be bread on my table. Because David said to us, once I was young, but now I'm old. But I've never seen the righteous forsaken or a seed begging for bread. And the last book that I'm holding up for you is called, Who's Holding Your Ladder? Who's Holding Your Ladder simply reminds us that if you get the right people holding your ladder, you can go higher. If nobody's holding your ladder, you can't go anywhere. This is why I know the three to five people closest to you in your life will define your life. If you're hanging with turkeys, <laughs> you'll be a turkey. If you're hanging with eagles, you're going to be an eagle. Who's holding your ladder? I'll meet you at the table. I'll be happy to sign your books for you. If you don't want me to sign your books, sign them yourselves. Nobody know the difference. Thank you so very much. God bless you.